or you want to do the meeting? The okay, yeah, meeting. thanks very much, Gail. Uh, I am uh, pleased to uh, introduce John Marsliff from the University of Washington in the uh, School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. John uh, is originally from Kansas and made his way west into Missoula first and then uh, made his way down to Flagstaff, Arizona, where he got a, a master's degree and then a doctorate also at Flagstaff in northern Arizona. So he has uh, been primarily interested in uh, studying uh, jays, uh, ravens, um, more recently in the Seattle area, crows. And I, I don't know, John, did you study uh, nutcrackers as well? Did do, did do yeah. some things with nutcrackers, made my living, my wife and I catching nutcrackers for our advisor and grad oh, school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought you might have been involved in that. A remarkable species. So uh, Jay, uh, John has been uh, involved in some re really interesting re research on uh, crows on the uh, University of Washington campus and, and other areas there and then uh, has taken up research on uh, ravens and their role in the, uh, the whole predator-prey relationships in Yellowstone. So he uh, and a colleague are going to talk to us about that uh, tonight. So John, uh, it's all yours. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks Dave for inviting me uh, and um, for the opportunity to talk with, with all of you up there in Montana. Um, this is a project that we really just started, and so most of what I'll talk about uh, today is um, pretty descriptive, but there's some great stories we've already learned about these birds, and uh, I'm sure some of you and, and I have certainly been very curious about how ravens exploit wolves and people uh, for some time, and um, this has been a great opportunity to be able to, um, to get at that uh, information. And if I can... Interesting. Well, it's all, it, you know, every time you get into one of these presentations on this platform, something's just a little bit different. So <laughs> yeah. uh, pardon me for that. But uh, this is a relationship that is uh, right at home for you all. These are the number of ravens per year in Montana as counted on um, Christmas bird count uh, observations. And this is a pattern that's reflective of the entire Western US uh, and, and most of uh, the United States, even where ravens are recolonizing in the Northeast. Their numbers have been increasing dramatically. It really is a response of these uh, birds to just uh, again reiterate to us what successful adapters and colonizers they are of, of new areas. It's one of the most widely distributed songbirds of, in the world from um, the Arctic down to Nicaragua. Hmm. There's a, I, what I want to do, what we go by here? Dang it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about raven biology for you. So we're kind of speaking the same language um, and then really talk about their exploitation of people and wolves in, in the Yellowstone area where our new research is occurring in a bit more detail and end with a little bit of uh, discussion about concerns you may have for increasing raven populations and uh, sensitive species that are their incidental prey. So the, the basic social structure of ravens is uh, that they are um, permanently monogamous uh, when they attain breeding status. And that's not so closely related to age as it is to dominance. Uh, to, to become a dominant raven may take anywhere from two to 15 or more years in, in parts of Europe. Um, these birds remain as uh, non-breeders until they are able to defend and secure a territory and, and get a mate on that territory as well. Um, this video will just show one behavior that you've probably seen and commonly see ravens allopreening uh, one another. Um, the, the mated pair, in this case, it's a male preening this female. Um, but they often will sit side by side. The males are a little bit bigger than the females and um, they will preen each other to remove ectoparasites from spots where they can't get. But there's another uh, aspect of raven social behavior that occurs in uh, birds before they attain breeding status. And we refer to these as vagrants or uh, wandering uh, ravens, non-breeding, non-territorial birds. 
Again, this is a time period that's variable in duration, but characterized by birds that aggregate at rich food resources and, uh, and eat those resources. They are not a stable flock by any means, although individuals may form um, somewhat pair-like relationships with one another within that, um, within that group. But the groups reassemble and mix and, and coalesce at new places where there's uh, rich foods like carcasses uh, or human resources. And the basics of how these birds reassemble, uh, Bern Heinrich and I worked out in Maine uh, many years ago, and basically the story goes like this. A, a rich resource like a dead moose here may be first initially found by the territorial pair that, that lives in that place. They're, they're looking all the time for food. When they find it, they will eat that resource and they will be as quiet as they can and as inconspicuous as possible about it, try to get as much of it cached or eaten as they can. But at some point, a, a vagrant bird will fly by like the tagged one here, it will notice those birds down there and it will come and try to access that food. And as it tries to access it, the territorial pair is aggressive and defends that resource, attacks those vagrants that try to get close. Those vagrants end up calling a lot, making a variety of sounds that attract other ravens to the area. And eventually a small group assembles, but until they get nine or more birds, uh, they really cannot access food reliably. And so eventually some of these birds go back to these larger communal roosts at night. There might be a hundred or more birds in these roosts. And if a bird at that roost doesn't know where food is, uh, one, one morning it will follow others that do seem to know where food is and fly directly to the food. And in this way, a group assembles in a, a reciprocal fashion so that the, the bird here, the tag bird that knew of the moose that, that flew to the roost and back to the moose the next day brought others with it, incidentally. And the next time, maybe this guy will find the moose and the tag bird will follow that individual or a different individual to food. So uh, it's advantageous to not only the bird that follows and gets a new resource, but to that individual that leads because the individual that led couldn't feed on its own or in a small group with those powerful adults. So having a larger group of non-breeders is able to take over the resource from that territorial pair. Well, that's the situation where there weren't large carnivores and there were human resources around, but not a lot of large carnivores. And the situation now that wolves have recolonized the West is quite different, I think. And what we have instead of, uh, you know, a, a winter kill uh, animal, which um, could last a long time if it's not being eaten by um, a pack of carnivores. Now we have situations like this where wolves come in, they, they eat most of the food quite quickly and the scavengers come in and have to make, uh, make do with a smaller amount of food and a shorter amount of time to consume it. And so in this photograph by Aaron Stoller, uh, you can see several of our tagged ravens uh, at this uh, elk calf killed by wolves and a golden eagle sitting right on top of it. They also exploit human resources, uh, not, just, um, not just natural resources. And, and you're all familiar if you've been to any sewage ponds looking for waterfowl, you've probably seen ravens there. They pick the fat that floats up off of the uh, treatment, uh, treated water and, and use that as a reliable source. They, of course, raid garbage. And um, how, these, how these different resources play out, the duration they're available, the predictability, the quality, uh, should influence how these animals, the ravens, move between different resources and how they exploit us and our resources like this versus uh, wolves. So um, we were lucky enough to uh, get funded to study this in more detail in Yellowstone. Um, and we had two basic objectives, to understand that relative use of wolf and uh, anthropogenic resources and how that varied uh, with, with aspects of the birds and the, and the environment. And then uh, determine how, uh, if there are mechanisms by which wolves or by which ravens exploit wolves, do they follow them? Do they just um, opportunistically find their kills? Things like that. And we've got a pretty good handle on, on number one and we're starting to get at number two. And, and this work was funded by the University of Washington, Nat Geo and uh, the Max Planck Institute, uh, which funded um, my colleague in this endeavor. 
um, who I will show you in just a second, but Matias Loretto is his name. So first off, let me show you how we catch these birds. Um, we use a, a net launcher to do this. And we, we, in Yellowstone, have either put out food or in this case, like the three birds that are eating this small carcass here, this was provided by uh, wolves. And our gun is just going off. Uh, we end up getting two of the three birds here. And in this way, we've been able to uh, tag 63 birds with um, satellite transmitters as shown here uh, uh, in the park now. And these transmitters are, are, I mean, if you've ever done any telemetry, these, these new sorts of transmitters are just phenomenal. We've got over, well, almost a half a million locations in this first year of our work from these transmitters. They communicate with the cell network, they're charged by solar um, radiation, and uh, they can last for a long time on these, these birds and provide data even when the parks close for pandemics and, and other things that came our way this year. So Matias Loretto is, the, is my main collaborator. He is a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute. And we're also working with the Wolf and Cougar teams in Yellowstone. Many of you, I'm sure, know Doug Smith and Dan Staler. Lauren Walker is the bird lead there now. And a couple of undergrads at the U are working on their theses on this project, Cameron Ho and Georgia Cam uh, Coleman. So first off, let me tell you a little bit of the, of the information we're finding with these birds. And I really want to focus on what individuals are doing and how they're, um, how they're exploiting these different resources. But first, um, we, we see them using just about everything you can imagine on the landscape. And we group them here as uh, road kills, gut piles, which they get during the hunting seasons, the, the fall hunting season, and in the spring when um, tribal hunters are there taking Bison, that's a, quite a bonanza for these birds. Uh, they exploit agriculture, uh, the waste treatment plants, as I said. They just they exploit dispersed natural resources. And we're trying to understand really what this is in more detail, but I can tell you that it includes things like flipping over bison patties for, for insect larvae, um, hawking salmon flies uh, during the salmon fly hatches along the rivers. Um, probably taking army cutworm moths up on uh, high peaks in the autumn and uh, late summer. So they, they switch between um, these resources in the, the, the spring and summertime and in the autumn, they're really focused in on hunter uh, provided resources. They also take other carcasses, normal winter kill, and they exploit wolves to a, um, to a lesser degree. So first off, the breeding birds, they've got different constraints to deal with than the non-breeders in terms of what food they can exploit. They've got hungry mouths to feed and, and they've got, um, this case only two, but in some cases four young to keep uh, fed throughout the breeding season. So they're spending most of their time uh, close to their territory gathering uh, those foods. And as an example, those of you who have been down to the park might have been through uh, the Mud Volcano area. And the parking lot at Mud Volcano is the hangout of a territorial bird that we have tagged now. This is a male. And you can see during the breeding season, May to August or so, it's really very close to its, uh, its center of its territory all the time. Its nest was right over here. And it really uh, rarely wandered more than about five miles away from that spot. Its nest was in a uh, lodgepole. It produced three fledglings, he and his mate. And uh, towards the end of the year, uh, those young are expelled from the territory and the breeding birds start to wander widely. Uh, their travels expanded tenfold in the autumn. From 5.6 miles across the range to 57. And where they're going, here's, here's Mud Volcano and the concentration of points that I told you, they're all going up north. Uh, to, um, to the Gardner area to work the hunting zone there just above uh, town that's rich with uh, gut piles. Occasionally they'll go over to West Yellowstone and exploit the town or a compost facility that's right outside of town as well. These are territorial birds. We did not expect these birds to make these 57 mile one-way commutes on a daily basis uh, during this time of the year. But when you think about it, Hunting season starts right when the park roads shut down and there's not much going on uh, interior to the park other than uh, wolves, for example. 
So why go northwest? As I said, they're exploiting hunters uh, to a large degree, the hunting areas around Jardine and over um, uh, just across the river. And they're also exploiting those dumps. So the Gardner dump and the sewage ponds are here. They go up the Paradise Valley, uh, uh, all the way up the valley and, and even short distances up to Corwin Springs in that area. So again, this is just shows those movements of that territorial bird uh, heading uh, up to the to the hunting grounds in the autumn and in the in the early autumn, just starting to go up there and sometimes in the spring for the um, the hunt of the tribal hunters. So non-breeders, in contrast, have a completely different um, set of constraints. They don't they're not tied to place during the breeding season. They're free to wander widely and they do. This is a bird that they touched down by you guys, uh, but it's living up in Alberta now, enjoying life on the, the ranch up there. Uh, but this bird wandered all over. It used um, roosts, large communal roosts of over a thousand ravens on power lines, the red dots here. It continues to roost on power lines up in Canada. And it, over the course of about five months, made this, this trek of 750 plus kilometers, uh, a record for a raven movement. But in general, the ravens that are non-breeders have home ranges, however you want to calculate them, that are um, orders of magnitude greater than the, the breeders. So let me tell you about one of these non-breeders just in detail here. Um, we got to know some of these individuals and uh, we named some, but for the most part, they were already named when we came to, to catch them. And, and this bird was called Bernie by a construction crew that was working on road construction in the park. And Bernie and another bird, we presumed was his mate, would spend every day, and here's his first few points after we tagged him, right with the crew. And they were so bold as to walk up and down the highway there when the traffic was stopped for road construction. Bernie and his, his mate would walk up and down the road begging from cars. So he had a very small home range uh, to start with the first few days, but then uh, like all the other birds from uh, interior of the park started heading up north again to, um, to the Gardner area during the hunting season, as we just saw with the territorial bird. He then started to wander more widely in the winter, not acting like a breeder at all in this case. We, can't, we started doubting whether that bird we saw with him was his mate or maybe just a associate. Right before the, the novel coronavirus hit, the red area here is the area that he was exploiting, kind of again between um, the, the center of the park and, um, and Gardner. When the uh, shutdown occurred in the park for two months, um, this raven started wandering again more widely, exploiting all the areas it had already gone to and expanding a little bit more over here to the east. And then at the end of the, um, the breeding season, when he should have established a new nest, we knew now he was not a breeder. He was wandering a huge area all the way south down to the Tetons and not concentrated in one location. During the second hunting season, the next autumn, he again uh, continued to travel a huge area, but again, went back up to the, to the hunting grounds around Jardine and, and, and across the river. And, uh, started by the end of this period to, to be spending a lot more time south, way down uh, by, by the Tetons. So just as an example of, of a bird that we thought was a breeder, apparently is not, or was at least a failed breeder perhaps, over one year covered a, a perimeter of 500 plus miles in an area of 6,500 square miles. So Nothing uh, prepared us to see that sort of movement in these birds. And again, I would just point out that in the old days when we had to track a bird down uh, with the transmitter on to get its location, we would never have been able to document this sort of uh, area that it covers. But clearly anything in this, this place, any resource is potentially exploitable uh, by these birds. So let's look at some, <clears throat> some more individual strategies. And, and how they exploit different resources in particular. And I'll start with wolves. 
because that's been the, the fascination to try to understand really if these are truly wolf birds or are they sewage birds, some might say, or, or trash birds. Uh, but I think they're uh, a little of both. And I'll, I'll convince you of that, I hope, with the next few individuals we talk about. Um, but these birds have had a long association in mythology with, with wolves, uh, in observations here, some from Barry Lopez, that, that ravens may lead wolves to prey. Uh, they certainly exploit the kills that wolves make. Um, they have you know, lots of uh, games they play. They do chase and tug and, and, um, and have lots of spare time to roll in the snow and, and have a good time out there. And they're both held in, in high regard because of their association and what they provide for one another. And then there's some more scientific observations. Um, David Meech has observed in Isle Royale uh, that it's very common for ravens to follow wolf packs, wait for them to make a kill and then feed on it as soon as the wolves leave. Um, that's something we hope to, to, to document more fully. We've seen some of that. Um, and they, they're very dependent. In Isle Royale, he says, this flock of ravens seems completely dependent on wolves for their food. Well, I would bet they're not, given the sorts of movements we've seen. But again, um, until you look at these different places where they interact with different uh, predators and prey, um, we, we don't really know the answer to that. And uh, Dan Stoller and and Berndt and uh, Doug Smith observed some cases that seem to be ravens harassing injured prey that might draw the attention of wolves uh, to them. So this plus and minus, this back and forth, that, that certainly ravens benefit from wolves, but how much do wolves benefit from ravens is a question. Well, just to show you some earlier data that, that Dan uh, Staler collected to show this, the tight association, uh, when you see in this case, he quantified um, all the observations of ravens that were associated uh, when he saw wolves or coyotes or other aspects of the, on the landscape. And when, when you see wolves, basically, all their actions combined, 87% of the time, there's a raven there as well. Very different than with a coyote, only 3% of the time. So they definitely seem to have an affinity for wolves. And um, he showed that they basically um, follow hunting wolves. And in this, in this little experiment here, uh, he shows that after he placed a carcass in the field or looked at a wolf kill after the kill was made, that at a wolf kill, basically the number of um, ravens was immediate, two or three there right away, and that increased dramatically over the first hour. So this is recruitment, not from the roost like we saw in, in New England, but locally, uh, perhaps by the sight or sound or independent discovery of that um, kill. Certainly a, a lot more birds there in the hour than were there when the kill was made. And in response to putting out a carcass, nothing, basically. No, no birds coming in during that time. So they're clearly uh, focused on wolves and they use wolves to, to get uh, kills. And of course, um, anybody who's been to Yellowstone and watched a wolf kill has seen a lot of ravens and magpies and coyotes and all sorts of things at them. Well, of our tagged birds, we can start getting some numbers on how frequent this is. And uh, there were 204 wolf kills that were documented by, uh, by the wolf crew uh, over the last year in Yellowstone. And 43% of those had one, at least one of our tagged birds visited. And a couple of them had a dozen of our tag birds at them. So, so yeah, they do um, follow and, or they do exploit these uh, carcasses, but a lot of individual carcasses uh, by wolves are not exploited by the same birds. It's, it's not that our birds are going to every single one there, uh, but instead there was a subset that was used. And if we look at the number of wolf kills a particular raven exploited, um, many individuals um, here, uh, a lot of adults in this case, didn't exploit any wolf kills that we knew of. Um, uh, a greater majority of the, of the adults, the gray bar here, um, exploited at least one, uh, one to four wolf kills. And of those individuals, a few of them exploited a lot. 22% were regular wolfers, I would call them. And um, they exploited, in this case, um, five or more uh, kills uh, during our study period. And 
the uh, some of the non-breeding vagrant birds, the older ones, the sub-adults we call them here, these are individuals that are at least two years old. Um, they also exploit those, uh, heavily exploit wolf kills, but the juveniles we had tagged, uh, we had six juveniles and none of those uh, were consistently exploiting wolf kills. It's a dangerous and a competitive place to be at one of those kills. And um, it's it seems to be exploited mostly by the older, birds and those that are holding territories nearby, uh, much like the discovery of a, of a winter killed animal is by first by those tagged or first by those dominant um, territorial birds. So here's a kind of dynamic that occurs uh, in, in respect to when a kill is made. This was a bull elk I was watching in, in the Lamar last winter. And uh, this, this started off, there were wolves hunting and one raven with those wolves that were hunting. And soon thereafter, there were three or four ravens, I counted four maximum, with the wolves. And at that point, they killed an elk. And quickly thereafter, the number of ravens, just like Dan had shown in his early work, uh, increased up to 15 uh, ravens foraging or trying to forage with the wolves. They didn't get much right away because the wolves were at the, at the carcass. And then that subsides during the night uh, as, as the day wears on and birds go to roost. And the important thing is then the next morning, we start here with, with seven birds. We had at least 15 the day before, get up to 10. And then it's by seven in the morning, we have 23 birds there. So there may be some recruitment from roost. This is just shortly after sunrise still. Uh, these birds that increase from 15 that I knew about to, to you know, eight or so more uh, might have been recruited from a roost. But from that point on, there are no great increases from one night to the next morning. But instead, you have pulses, increases, and decreases during the day, and a gradual increasing in the total number up to 30 uh, ravens um, during the day. So again, attraction from the local environment rather than from a nocturnal roost. Then as the food's consumed, the elk's eaten up, uh, the, the birds gradually leave. Another example, a more typical one that occurs there is a kill might be made at night. Uh, one raven discovers it early in the morning, a few accumulate there in the next hour, and then wham, up to a large number uh, by noon or so of that day. But this is, a, this is an accumulation during that uh, daylight hour, not from one roost to the, or not from one evening to the next day. And um, you basically have the attraction and the finding of these uh, kills happening irrespective of where individuals are roosting. So I can, I can show you the example of that last one uh, by looking at four of our tag birds that came to exploit this uh, kill. And there are still some mysteries here of how this happens, but some of it's uh, pretty obvious. Like for example, the territorial birds, or there are four birds that are shown here. There's two territorial, territorial birds in red and purple. The dots here are just their locations every half hour. And then there's a non-breeder in green up here that was hanging out by Bozeman, and another one that was over here by Billings in yellow. And during that first uh, day, uh, when the kill is made, those territorial birds are right there and starting to exploit that resource. Um, and then uh, they come in and they're right on the kill uh, the, the next day. Uh, and they, they feed on it on and off throughout that day while the wolves are there. The next day, on day two of this, the non-breeder that was in Bozeman, for some reason, travels 140 miles and ends up at that kill and feeds at it for a while that day and then, then goes back to Bozeman. The fourth day, the breeder, the non-breeder from Billings makes a beeline 100 miles into that kill. How it does this, how it knows about this, I don't know. Um, we've got a lot of hypotheses. I'd be curious to, to hear what you guys think. Um, there's a lot of commotion around a kill, not only by the wolves, but by the birds that are exploiting it as well. But 100 miles away, I don't think they're hearing uh, that across the, the bear twos. Mm -hmm. And we know they're not doing this by communal roost, at least some of the birds aren't. I mean, we only have a, you know, a fraction of them tagged. But in this case, for example, there was a communal roost high up in the uh, mountains. They, they tend to roost sometimes at 10,000 feet, uh, which is pretty incredible to me in the winter. 
Um, but they're up there roosting. And um, they, one of these birds at the communal roost, the green one here, did come down and exploit the wolf kill that day. It was, there was a non-breeder that came over from Bozeman. It roosted there and came down and, and exploited the next day. But there were two other um, roost, two other non-breeders in that communal roost that went back to, uh, to the gardener area the next day instead of coming down only a few miles to, the, to this wolf kill. So clearly, if information was being exchanged here about this kill, these guys would come down. But again, remember, this is a competitive, dangerous place. Not only are there predators that could kill you there from eagles to coyotes to wolves, but um, you, have to, you have to compete with all the other ravens that are there. And if you're a non-breeding vagrant, you might not be um, bold enough or confident enough to be able to get in there and, and get any food. And you may be better off going to some of these more reliable human resources. The two territorial birds that exploited it also um, show the, you know, that, that you don't have to be in a roost to find these foods because they were roosting independently of the communal roost in different places. Well, we, we also know that wolves, uh, that ravens hang out around wolf dens and exploit the, the scraps that are brought in and food that's provided to the, to the pups. And uh, we're just starting to get a handle on this, but this last summer, um, we had uh, a few ravens that uh, visited uh, one or two, um, two uh, wolf dens, two different dens. And um, we had uh, 13 visitors in total, ravens that went to wolf dens. None of those were those juveniles. Again, those birds are low on the dominance hierarchy and unlikely to get uh, any of this food. And so they just don't seem to use those resources. A lot of our, um, a lot of the tag birds did not visit any of the dens. Mainly you have to live close to it or you have to be a dominant vagrant. A few of the um, dens attracted uh, four of our um, four of our tag birds at once. So we can maybe start to see as we watch these in more detail in the coming years, some of the dynamic that occurs there. Knowing the status and the location and, and other aspects of the individual ravens that are involved in these uh, associations. So again, just some imagery to show how this might play out on the landscape. Each of these dots are, are raven locations, different colors, different individuals. And here's the Dan in blue. And we have a male, couple male non-breeders and a fail, female breeder that were, ex, they were found exploiting this den. But lots of other birds that aren't going there. And likewise here in the interior of the park, uh, we have a, a den uh, in orange in, in the year we were looking at the ravens here and um, several ravens that are exploiting that an adult male, female, and a non-breeding uh, male. But they don't always do that. The balloons here indicate uh, dens uh, here and lots of raven activity in the area, but they're not using it at the same time. And same here, a couple of balloons indicating uh, dens in 2020, lots of ravens in the area flying over, but not regularly exploiting that. So this is, this is a resource, but it's not a one that's highly exploited. Well, we're just starting to get at uh, what benefit wolves may get from ravens. And I would have bet none <laughs> was, was my first guess. And it still may be true, but there's a, some tantalizing um, tidbits here that suggest that uh, wolves might in fact uh, find some of their kills to scavenge, at least from, uh, from ravens. So let me tell you what's going to be in these uh, maps coming up, and I'll, I'll then demonstrate kind of the, the response of these birds. So first off, this is a situation the the numbered balloons in this case are resources that we mapped without looking at um, wolf distributions. We just looked at the distribution of ravens, and we saw uh, that there were a concentration of ravens, more than uh, one raven for a long period of time, a day at least, um, at this particular spot. So, so we marked it, thinking it really seems like a carcass because when we look at kills that we knew were wolf kills, we also see these concentrations of ravens there. So uh, we had a concentration of our raven locations, I should say. This is all remote. Uh, we weren't on the ground to see this, 
But ravens were accumulated there for uh, several days, and we thought, well, oh, it looks like it looks like there's a kill there. Same thing here, the yellow is another one of these sites. Now the dots are different wolves that are uh, radio tagged in the park. And you can see here, there's this red animal. Um, he's um, wolf 1200M from the Cougar Creek pack that was with two of our tagged ravens at this kill at the same time on the same days. So what this looks like since the wolf was there and the ravens there at the same time, it suggests to me that it's probably a kill that the wolves made that pack made and the, the ravens exploited, just like we had been seeing. But in this case, we've got ravens here because we've already got the yellow balloon at the, the 2nd of February last year in the morning. And we don't have any wolves there that we know of. We've got two tagged wolves uh, from the Junction Butte pack um, just down to the southeast, but none right at the kill. So this might be a, a natural or a, a non-predator death of a bison or an elk that these ravens are exploiting. And there were four of our ravens there, which suggests that it's probably a pretty big resource like a, like a bison. So if we start off then and go to the next uh, morning, the two female wolves from the pack, including the alpha are, are close in, but they're not right on the site, um, at least from the telemetry locations, not on the site yet that the ravens are at. Two days, a uh, day later, so two days after ravens first were seen at that site, 850, now those uh, wolves are there and, and the, the male is there as well. So we've got of the three tagged individuals in the pack, they're all there, probably the rest of the pack is, is there as well. But that's two days after ravens were there. So this suggests to me, again, that this was a winter kill, uh, killed animal that ravens discovered and perhaps by, by their activities, their flights, their calls, uh, that these wolves found it um, through that activity or perhaps through the activity of other scavengers that were there. But it suggests some benefit to the wolves from the, the raven activity or other scavenger activity. They, they remained there, the wolves were all on that, uh, that site the next day. And then they headed back to the Southeast the day after. Ravens still remained. And then the next day, everything's gone. So this has been cleaned up. So we have that situation where we had a raven aggregation uh, 36 times that involved wolves as well. And about half of those cases, the wolf arrived before or simultaneously with the raven, suggests to me it's a kill. But in 17 cases, half of the times we were able to, to, to get this observation, um, the ravens arrived before the wolf. So they may have been providing some information on the landscape uh, to allow the, the wolves to more effectively find this uh, scavenging resource. Now, if we add in the kills that, that ravens are provided by wolves directly uh, to, this, to this mix, it's something like a six time greater benefit to the raven than the wolf in terms of finding food uh, out there in, in, on the, uh, the winterscape. The interesting thing is that um, this, although it's asymmetrical, this relationship between raven and wolf, with ravens benefiting much more than wolves, uh, with cougars, it's um, completely different. Cougars never came in to a site uh, after the ravens had found it. They're always there before or at the same time the ravens got it. So cougars aren't scavenging kills like wolves are in this situation. And, and that makes sense from their biology, but it also helps us understand a little better that, yeah, I think these cases where wolves come in after ravens are scavenging events uh, by the wolves that are probably aided by the activity at that site. Well, those are wolfers, but of course that's not all ravens do in Yellowstone. Uh, a lot of them are beggars. I, I don't think this was anybody I saw on the Zoom getting ready to toss a, a ham sandwich. It's hidden in his hand to this raven at Tower Junction. If any of you have stopped there, you, you've been harassed by this pair of ravens that lives there. Uh, we do not have them tagged, but we have others tagged that are beggars. This one, uh, the locals in Cook City called Steve. Although when I informed them it was probably a female by its size, uh, some of them at least were willing to change his name to Stevie. But uh, nonetheless, this bird was, has a bit of a hurt foot. It wasn't obvious to me when I captured it, but it seems like a bit of a ligament problem in its one foot. 
And it had been known a year before I caught this bird in Cook City. And uh, it's a favorite of the town. It's introduced me to some, some interesting people that live in Cook City and beyond. <laughs> And um, by following Stevie's antics around, I, I found uh, this woman here in the, through the glass who is a waitress at the, the bar in Cook City and she brings home roast beef and, and feeds Stevie roast beef whenever, he, whenever she wants it. But he's gotta work, he has to ring that bell to be able to get the, the prize. And so um, she'll sit inside and, and Stevie used to pound on their window to such an extent that she and her husband were afraid he was gonna break the glass. So they, they hung the bell up. And as um, Stevie's getting closer there to it, she's encouraging him. He's eating some scraps that are outside right now. But once he sees a big prize inside, um, she'll ring the bell and um, the woman will come out, Molly will come out and, and feed this bird. And so in this way, obviously, I don't know who taught who, <laughs> what in this case, but they're both enjoying and exploiting one another uh, really uh, fairly mutually uh, beneficial in this case. But gets a look at the food, rings the bell, she comes out and feeds him. <laughs> so here's Steve's travels. Now Cook City's in, in the big uh, cluster here, but Steve doesn't just go to Cook City. She hangs out in Cody. She goes over to, uh, to Gardner every once in a while, but not very regularly. Um, but as we followed her locations, we, I started seeing her concentrated activity here by Kersey Lake as well. It's up in the, here's um, Cook City and um, up in the Beartooth Wilderness area. And as I looked under that cloud of points, I saw this cabin. And about that same time, I got an email from a lawyer who said that his friend was being visited by a tagged raven up by Kersey Lake. And so uh, we hiked in uh, to, the, to the lake. Here's the cabin from the ground to see what was going on. And, and we found this fella uh, feeding um, Stevie. Here he's getting a, got, she got a chip. This turns out to be the former Lieutenant Governor of South Dakota. So you meet some interesting people following Ravens. Well, in addition to them being uh, beggars and wolfers, they're thieves. They'll steal things from your backpacks. This is in Grand Canyon, obviously not Yellowstone, but uh, rifling through a backpack here to try to get something edible out of it. This bird doesn't get anything, but I'd been told uh, about these birds doing this in the old faithful area, especially with snowmobiles. And so I was anxious to go there and get a look at this uh, last winter. Uh, so we got in there and um, we definitely have, uh, have ravens that are using this area. We have two birds that are tagged there, two territorial birds. And you can see they've split up the, the area quite well, two breeding females. And um, we were anxious to basically see how they allocate their time between places like you know, um, West Yellowstone and Island Park and um, other parts with human resources and the actual uh, destination of tourists in the park. And they, they beg from them. They're out at the, the can, garbage cans here trying to get food as people are throwing things away. And um, they aren't able to get into snowmobiles anymore. And I think this is an interesting uh, example of what I call cultural coevolution, how our behavior has changed animals' behavior and their behavior has changed our behavior and back and forth kind of like an arms race. And this is the new uh, saddlebag on all snowmobiles that come into Yellowstone. It's a hard case with a locking mechanism. And the reason uh, that these sorts of saddlebags are used now is because the old Velcro ones are the ones the Ravens would get into and steal things from. And so the tour operators have, have used new, new machines with these um, Raven-proof containers on the back. The Ravens aren't happy about this. This is a hole torn into the seat by Ravens and this is not uncommon. Uh, the tour operators there told me that they get a couple of their bikes every year torn into by the ravens that are perhaps frustrated with not being able to get that food. So it's, it's an ongoing uh, interaction in Yellowstone and one that we're just starting to really understand. What we do know is that these ravens uh, cover a huge area. They exploit anything edible on the landscape as far as I can tell. Much of that is things that we put on the landscape, like agricultural uh, crops, like dumps, 
uh, water treatment places. All of these resources, hunting uh, offal that's provided, all of these resources are fueling this raven increase that we see across the West and, and Montana here in this uh, plot. And there's concern, of course, about this for their impact on desert tortoises in the Mojave, greater sage grouse across the Intermountain West, snowy plovers and other shorebirds on the coasts and, and larger lakes. And the result of this is um, there's basically a raven hit squad now, um, certainly there's a government funded one in wildlife services that kills about 10,000 ravens every year and proposals to kill many, many more oil eggs and reduce the raven population directly for the benefit of these species. But my point is that wildlife services and others have been doing this now for a couple of decades and this graph keeps going up and the actual killing and removal of individual ravens is having no effect on the number of ravens in the landscape. And instead, what we should really do is focus on those subsidies. We, we've known that um, subsidies are driving raven populations for decades now, and yet very little has been done to try to control those. There have been some, uh, some headway made with respect to um, dump closures and covering dumps with, with dirt and things like that, um, but a lot more could and needs to be done if we're really truly concerned about uh, restoring a more balanced system to the Western ecosystems. Um, and, and the only way we're gonna do that in a sustainable way and a ethical way is to take care of the trash and other resources that we're putting out in the environment and take the message from the ravens uh, that, that we've left the, the situation in a, in a bad state and one that we need to correct rather than just taking it out on the ravens. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. Sorry for going a little late here for you guys. Um, I wanna point out a couple of things. First, you could track our ravens with this app, Animal Tracker. It's free from Mox Plunk. You can get it from any of your uh, favorite um, app stores. And that shows uh, a little with a bit of a delay where our birds are at. Uh, you can see if that one from Canada comes back down uh, by you guys. It came across the border a bit this winter, but seems happy in his new land. Um, if you're interested in, in crows or even uh, raven behavior, and especially you mentioned some of the stuff you're doing with, um, with education for kids, we have a, another free app, Crow Scientist, that kids can use to go out and collect data on crow behavior and uh, use that for for scientific projects and just fun. It's a fun game they can play. And then several books, uh, my wife and I did one on the, the Raven uh, interactions uh, a few years ago and more recent ones about suburban birds and, and bird responses to ag, which includes several um, farms in Montana that I visited um, that's out more recently. So with that, I will try to get out of here and stop sharing. And if there's anybody still alive out there, I can be glad to try to answer your questions. Thanks, John, that was great. I really appreciate that. You bet, Dave. I have a, a question. Uh, well, it's not a question, it's a comment. And that is, I'm surprised how well uh, ravens read the environment. Uh, they're picking up signals everywhere. And that's certainly going to help wolves, but also helps Ravens, and you had a question. You had a, a comment in there about uh, uh, a few individual ravens. Instead of going to that one place where there was a wolf kill, went to Gardner or someplace else. Yeah, maybe they learned that. Well, maybe it's too competitive there. I better go somewhere else where it might be easier pickings. I I think they have such a huge cognitive map of the resources that are out there. I mean, it's a it's a tremendously large area. Um, and, and yet they have a regular cycle that they work and they know where to go. If this resource isn't available, they, they know where to go and, and they just head there. And these young birds, perhaps it'll be interesting to follow them for several years to see how they build up that, that information base that they use. Yeah, interesting. Uh, 
anybody have questions, you can use the chat or just go ahead. It's open. There's a comment that was so interesting. Thanks, John. You bet. How long do ravens live? Yeah, good question. I didn't put those data in, but um, they have a mortality that's about 10% a year. So um, during that first year or, or when they're uh, vagrant non-breeders, their mortality is probably uh, fairly high. Once they establish on the territory, it, it's lower, but it's still higher than crows. Um, so you will have some ravens out there that are, um, you know, I think the record we had, we had one of our tag birds that I caught was tagged 13 years ago and in the Tetons, just by chance. Wow. And um, it's not going to be uncommon in the breeding pool, I think, to have some 13 year old birds. But in Europe, the oldest uh, wild raven is, is up to 15 years. And I just got a crow return, a live crow that's uh, 18 in Seattle. So, you know, that's probably that's probably where you're starting to get to the to the extent of it. Um, maybe 20, 30 years in the wild would be possible, un but unusual. Thank you. There's a question, one question in the chat box. Do you want me to read it to you, John? I can see it now. Let me just okay. read it here. Yep. Given the open landscape. How do you think these findings would differ? Yes, uh, from a more forested place like um, like where you guys are at. This is a great question. <clears throat> and um, I think some of the things you'll see differently in the more forested landscape is that uh, individuals won't be able to find these resources as easily during the day. So you might see greater recruitment from a roost at night to some of these, um, these resources. You might see greater reliance of ravens following wolves there if they're really keyed in on that. I'm just not convinced from what we're seeing that, that they are that much. But if you're going to exploit wolves and you can't hear and see for 50 miles or so to do it, then either you've got to stick with the wolves, which most of the time means you're, they're not gonna get anything, right? Every couple of days, you're gonna, you're gonna get nothing. And, um, or you're gonna learn about it at these roosts. But the, the problem with being at a roost and having to wait for the next day to go to that food source is that most of it's gone. Uh, the carnivores have cleaned it up. So it's a, it's a tough bind, I think, that these birds are in with respect to exploiting wolves. They have a short time window. When it's an open environment, they can do it very effectively like in Yellowstone. Where you guys are at, I bet it's less effective but I bet there are still, um, you know, a lot of birds that do exploit that resource. It's probably, um, it would be interesting to, to think that it's a more stable relationship there than in Yellowstone because it has to be to, to exploit it efficiently. Hmm. But it, I would say just one other thing there, if it's like, um, if it's like the comparison we have between Idaho and Maine, which is the same kind of you know, open and closed environment, you would expect roosts to be in generally larger in the open environment and smaller in the closed environment. Um, and, and that may be because they're exploiting more stable resources in the open like agriculture um, and, and more ephemeral resources like carcasses in the closed environment. Is it John? Dan, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't I, I don't really know how the Zoom works. This is my first time. So I just asked my question right now. Sure, go for it. Okay. So any thoughts on possible relationship with human hunters and ravens? Uh, interactions there? Oh yeah, I think that's a much stronger relationship now than wolves. Uh, I think it was a relationship from when I, I mean we we have shown the colonization in North America by ravens in the Pleistocene. And initially they came over before people, but a second wave of ravens came over right in the same time people were coming across Beringia. So I think this relationship of human hunters and ravens goes back from the time we started hunting <laughs> as a species and has continued. And today we know it's fairly well developed that ravens respond to gunshots like grizzlies do and come into those shots and they track hunters in that way. I mean, the, the way that the birds shifted 
from being in the interior of the park to immediately on opening day, literally within two days of opening day, they were all going to Gardner back and forth. They're keyed into that resource. And, and the young birds learn about it right away and they're exploiting it their first uh, autumn. Right, I know uh, my nephew had wounded a muley buck a few years ago up high in the North Fork of the Flathead. And we couldn't locate where that buck was. And it really seemed the ravens were leading us to that live, that live buck till we finished the kill. That's interesting. They certainly, there's, there's a lot of reports like that from Arctic people in particular. Um, I always have thought, I mean, if, if you're ever looking for a, something to scavenge out there, all you have to do is follow ravens and you're probably going to find it. So it's mm -hmm. interesting when it's a situation like that where the animal's not dead and they, um, and they come in. And uh, that's, that's really interesting. It's, it's, it's to me suggests that one, we pay a lot of attention to these sounds out there and, and, and use them. And maybe the ravens have picked up on that and they're using us as well, yeah. Did you leave it a good treat? Yes. <laughs> There's a big pack out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, there was a story. Um, yeah, do ravens perhaps follow more, uh, rely more on um, hearing <clears throat> than vision in a closed environment? Certainly that's the case. Their, their sounds are very, um, characteristic and loud. And we know we've done playback experiments with those calls around a carcass and ravens will come into it. So they could certainly do that. But, you know, in a dense environment, sound attenuates quickly also. So it just doesn't go that far. It's, it's not going to bring them in from 50 miles or 100, like we saw a couple of those individuals come in in Yellowstone. Somebody's asking if newborn ravens are black or some other color. They are black. When they come out of the nest, uh, they look basically like an adult raven, except they have pink mouths and blue eyes. John? Yes, Denny. Um, the, I was wondering, you know, that, that one raven that came from, uh, what, 100K or 100 miles away <laughs> to find that one skill that you, um, uh, do you think there's an intermediaries that haven't been tagged? Uh, that would might give the messages uh, might might pass the messages along um, in terms of how they communicate or 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 is there something else going on here? And all, obviously we got a sample size of one, so you know it could be an accident too for all, all we know. A absolutely, that bird had never gone that direction like that um, before. Seemed pretty direct, um, and we have other cases where they come in from long distances, but. To get at your point of intermediaries, I think that's very likely. There's there's almost like a raven telegraph out there, right? And they're mm -hmm. doing things. They may not. They're not saying, "Hey, come on over here." There's a kill, but they're yeah. just doing things. And other ravens are attracted to that. They come and they just kind of follow the raven action. And ravens right. that are exploiting that kill might be flying halfway up the, you know, up the valley towards Cook City and providing a signal that's that's intermediate um, in yeah. its in how far you have to detect it from, for sure. Well, there's also cars. The other thing yeah. we thought about in Yellowstone, I mean, <laughs> it's not just ravens that are at those kills, right? The, the, the packs on the road of cars watching them, that's a signal that the ravens could certainly use. So there's lots of information out there. And that's why it would be interesting to see the difference in that forested environment to, and a non, not as touristed, uh, wolf watching environment as there is in Yellowstone because it's pretty easy to find a wolf kill in Yellowstone. <laughs> yeah. Well, the inter the the interspecies communication stuff's been studied a lot by by uh, Air, uh, University of Montana folks, you know, uh, like chickadees tend to yep. uh, let everybody else in the world know what's going on uh, at any particular time, at least as far as danger is concerned. So I'm just wondering about other interspecies communication too, possibly possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's coyotes that are howling around there. There's, yeah, yeah uh, there's a lot of, there's eagles that are flying from long distances, locked in on it, that could give a, a signal to a raven that's mm -hmm. that's up high. Yeah. Um, there's absolutely lots of information, yes. It's for sure that they're smart enough to pick up on it, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, if it works once for them, they'll probably give it a second <laughs> or third chance, yeah. Yep. Thank you, very good information, cool. Yep. Got another question in the box. Huh. 
why do why do ravens eat the eyeballs of carcasses first uh, is a high level of protein it's it's accessible is what it is if there's yeah. a kill made by wolves or something they go right for the you know the best organ meat and 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 fatty uh meat they can get but when a um a carcass dies that isn't opened by a carnivore they have a hard time accessing that through the skin they can't they can't rip through the skin they'll go in through the anus they'll go in through other wounds or they'll take the eyes because they're accessible that's a great note to end on <laughs> or not end on but time for dinner <laughs> I like it there, I, any more questions that this fantastic uh, talk it really gets you thinking a lot more about what you're hearing when you're out yeah. there and, yeah. and all the interactions that's it's pretty neat and then the distance that just blows my mind um those distances that's just amazing that it's like a walk in the park to them yeah i mean they those commuters that are going the you know 30 40 miles one way each day back and forth they're doing it in an hour yeah, yeah so the, so the bird you see in gardner is the same bird you see down there you know in the valley and the same one down at the yeah and so it is these tags must have really helped you kind of decipher all that along with their location data that's pretty interesting yeah still a lot to learn but yeah time to do so what a fun species <laughs>